Are we ready, Jeremy? This conference will now be recorded. I'd like to call the village board meeting to order for Tuesday, October 26th. Roll call, please. President Mary Kardoski. Here. Trustee Gary Paul. Here. Trustee Steve Kabaki. Here. Trustee Allison Williams. Here. Trustee Tracy Flukey. Here. Trustee Chris Zerbel excused. Trustee, Trustee Jay Krieger excused. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. And please remember our men and women throughout the world in uniform. Um, I have no changes to the agenda. I need a motion to approve. Move to uh, approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Action on the open and closed minutes from the September 28, 2021 meeting. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve those minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Number six, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda, must state your name and address, limited to five minutes. The board's role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named, and the board is not able to take action at this meeting. Does anybody have any comments to make? I would like to recognize that we have Senator Rob Coles in the audience. I don't know if you want to come and make any comments, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. This is simply a courtesy visit. It's, this is one of my the municipalities that I represent in the second Senate district, at least at this point. <laughs> we'll see how the maps go. And I'd, I'd like to stop in it periodically and make sure you know you can place a face with uh, your needs and feel free that you can get in touch with me at some point. I was just uh, telling your new administrator uh, about uh, the ERTID change that passed through the Senate uh, a week and a half ago or so. My bill that would uh, allow uh, contaminants to be integrated into the ERTID formulas and facilitate more cleanup of these various contaminated sites. And I'm hoping that gets through the assembly shortly. Perhaps you can use that as a tool. You've been one of the leaders in the state and in uh, TIFs, uh, and perhaps you can use this at some point. I know if you can't, I know Green Bay will be able to use it because there's a lot of contaminated sites that aren't integrated into the, the TIFs at this point. But that's all I had, and unless somebody had some questions for me. Um, I just want to say thanks, um, Senator, for all of your help that you've given to the Village of Ashwaubenon through the years. You've been a great advocate for us, and you're a great advocate for the environment. Try to do the best we can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? <clears throat> okay, we'll move on. Number seven, written communications and or announcements. I have one. Um, Dear Mary and Village of Ashwabnan, uh, please accept this letter as notice of my resignation from the position of Village Trustee for Wards 1 and 2. My last day serving for the Village of Ashwabnan will be Monday, November 22nd. I have decided to sell my house and although I will continue to be an Ashwabnan resident, I will no longer be residing within Wards 1 and 2. It has been my pleasure serving on the Village Board and various committees for the last four years. Most importantly, it has been my honor to represent the constituents within Ashwaubenon. I appreciate all of the support I have received throughout my tenure and look forward to watch the continued growth, development, and success of the village of Ashwaubenon. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Let me be the first to say that it's been an honor to serve with you for the last four years. You've done a great job represent, representing wards one and two. That was my wards. So thank you for that. And. Um, I'm sure we'll see you around in the village. Oh yeah, I'm just going to a bigger house, that's all. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other communication or announcement? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. 
Action on consent agenda. Action on the operator's license. Change of agent for law two Green Bay TRS LLC DBA Delta Hotels by Marriott Jason Bajerk. Action on the change of agent GBWI Associates LLC DBA Aloft Hotel Stacy Crystal. The investment report, general fund financial report for September year to date, budgeted expenditures, and department reports. If nobody wants anything pulled, I will need a motion to approve. Move nope. to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed. Motion carried. 9A, public hearing. Public hearing regarding ordinance number 010-3-21, rezoning 2040 South Ashland Avenue, parcels VA-56-6, VA-56-2, and VA-56-7 from SE Sports and Entertainment to B3 Community Business. Aaron. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, as indicated on the map, uh, on the screen, Holiday Station Stores LLC is requesting rezoning the three subject parcels from SE Sports Entertainment to B3 Community Business uh, for purposes of use of the property for a convenience store, uh, gas station, and car wash. Uh, as indicated, the subject property is located at the southwest corner of Mike McCarthy Way and the South Ashland Frontage Road. Uh, Surrounding uh, zoning it includes SE, P public use, I1 uh, light industry. Uh, again, as indicated, as proposed to rezone to B3 community business. Uh, from a staff perspective, uh, if this property is located really anywhere else within the SE sports entertainment zoning district, we would not be in, uh, in favor of it. However, looking at the surrounding land uses, uh, the location uh, of it up against uh, South Ashland Avenue, uh, the railroad, surrounding land uses. It does make sense in this specific location uh, from a, uh, I guess again, a very specific uh, rezone to B3 to facilitate the redevelopment of this property. Uh, as many of you probably know, it does have the uh, uh, former warehouse building on there, it used to house Badger Ladder, uh, dilapidated fence and building. Uh, so this will clean that site up pretty significantly. The comprehensive plan identifies uh, commercial uses as uh, allowable uh, within this, uh, this area. Uh, as such, again, taking into account surrounding land uses uh, from a staff standpoint, we are supportive of the rezoning to B3 community business. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, did recommend approval at their meeting uh, on October 5th, 2021. Okay. This is a public hearing. Is there anybody who would like to speak for or against this item? Could you come up and state your name and address, please, for the record? Yes, my name is Rob Posowitz, and I uh, own Positive Enterprises, Green Bay Exposition Services. And I have the adjoining property on the uh, south side, the three buildings on Borban Avenue, right by the water pump station. The problem I see with that is the access road um, and making a left-hand turn off the access road if there's going to be a gas station there with diesel pumps and all the semi-trucks coming in there to refuel. Um, we service um, all the bars and up in or everything around the stadium, the, the Packers, you know, and doozies with all the various events that take place up at the Title Town District in Lambeau Field, in the atrium, in the parking lot, and the surrounding bars. And we haul our trucks and trailers up there and we have to make a left hand turn. And when it's bad enough now with trying to make a left-hand turn or a right-hand turn when there's a train going by because that, that the train or whatever adjusts the lights and those semis sit there because they can't go straight because they want to go down to 
Georgia Pacific or Super Value or whatever, and that blocks the whole intersection there. Now adding a gas station there and, and in increasing the traffic is just gonna create one big cluster at that intersection. If there's a train going by or you know trucks pulling out and wanting to go straight or go right onto Ashland Avenue or continuing straight to the paper mill. Aaron, uh, this, this station will have no diesel pumps, am I correct? It will not have speed diesel for, uh, for semi-trucks. It may have a diesel pump for diesel uh, vehicles, but it will not have semi-trailer uh, semi pumps. Right. Okay. Right. So I think that should alleviate some of the problem. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's that access road, even with, with the increased traffic and people stop there to go straight or right, you can't make a left there, you know, and, and you know, the... Um, the company next door, Green Bay Anodizing. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of traffic on that access road with all their deliveries as well, because they uh, they turn the um, their loading dock onto into that Borban Avenue, the short little dead end street. So you have all the the semis and delivery trucks that are you know coming and going there throughout, you know all day long into second shift as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of traffic for, and for us to try to turn left or anybody that's coming from Conger <coughs> forklift or using the access road, you know, down, you know, the bank and everything else on that road. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, hey, anybody else like to speak for or against this project? Anybody like to speak for or against this project? Okay, I need a motion to close the public hearing. So. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 9B, public hearing regarding ordinance number 010-1-21, adding commercial recreation indoor as a permitted use within the I-2 heavy industry zoning district. Aaron. This is a request uh, of a property owner uh, who has a property zoned uh, I-2 heavy industry. Uh, he'd like to use the property uh, for a hockey training facility. Uh, currently, hockey training or uh, really more generally commercial indoor recreation is not a permitted use within the I-2 uh, heavy industry zoning district. It is, however, a permitted use within the I-1 light industry and IP industrial park zoning districts. Uh, in fact, in the uh, text of the code, it does, it does actually mention I-2 heavy industry as well. Uh, so really, this is a uh, cleanup, uh, I believe, to include commercial recreation indoor as a permitted use within the I-2 uh, heavy industry uh, zoning district. Okay, is there anybody here who would like to speak for or against this item? Anybody here who'd like to speak for or against this item? Anybody here who'd like to speak for or against this item? Okay, I need a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9C, public hearing regarding ordinance number 010-2-21, amending section 17-4-400, accessory uses of village Ashwabnan municipal code relating to accessory buildings. Aaron. This was a, uh, a request that came out of the Site Plan Review Committee. Uh, we started receiving uh, requests for accessory buildings within the non-residential uh, zones of the village. Uh, Site Plan Review Committee and quite honestly staff struggled uh, with how to handle these because there was no direction for accessory buildings uh, in non-residential zoning districts. Uh, Site Plan Review Committee did ask me to put together a uh, draft ordinance that tries to put some standards in place for accessory buildings that would take care of things that really uh, really small shed type uses 
uh, that would take care of uh, lawn equipment, uh, outdoor storage, uh, things like that. Uh, the proposed ordinance uh, is meant to really clarify the size, location, architectural requirements. So we aren't applying our typical site plan review requirements to uh, a small you know, 144 square foot uh, accessory building that's gonna house a, uh, a lawnmower and snowblower. Uh, the ordinance does also clarify our requirements for accessory buildings for properties within the uh, P public use district as well. Uh, planning Commission, uh, our site plan review committee and planning commission did recommend approval uh, of the accessory building amendment. Okay. It's a public hearing. Would anybody like to speak for or against this item? Would anybody like to speak for or against this item? Would anybody like to speak for or against this item? Okay, I need a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, number 10, action items. 10A, action regarding ordinance number 010-3-21 Rezoning 2040 South Ashland Avenue, parcels VA-56-6, VA-56-2, and VA-56-7 from SE Sports and Entertainment to B3 Community Business. Now, Aaron, let me ask you this question, because this I think this was brought up at maybe Plan Commission about the, the frontage road with the traffic and how it was gonna navigate. Um, is there any way that we could sign it that they couldn't make a left-hand turn out of that? So what was discussed at, uh, at plan commission and actually and site plan uh, for that matter, uh, for the site plan review of the, the property was to uh, put signage on Mike McCarthy way, uh, basically saying, you know, do not block the intersection to make sure the intersection stays clear, that we don't have cars backing up and blocking uh, north-south uh, access to uh, the frontage road. Okay. Okay, so we've got that in the plan. Correct. Okay. Okay, any more discussion on this item? Um, yes, I do. Um, this was brought up, like uh, Aaron said, at, uh, especially at site plan committee. Uh, that was my concern. Uh, Rob being one that called me uh, a, a couple other companies gave me a call about the same problem that uh, Rob did a pretty good job on explaining. Uh, the answer that I gave Rob is that it will be marked, it will be controlled so that that intersection is not blocked as he described. Uh, if it is blocked and there is a problem, we will move forward to figure out a way not for that to happen. Now, yesterday was a primary example. I used that same intersection that uh, we're talking about. If you get a, part, a semi coming up to that stoplight and wanting to make either way, a left turn, right turn, uh, or go straight ahead, he'll plug that intersection up. It happened to me yesterday, and I know what they're talking about. Uh, it is a heavily used uh, intersection for the traffic on that frontage road. They do come all the way from Cormier all the way down to that particular intersection if they want to go to the north. So it could be a problem. It has been a problem. That light, Doug helped me out here, that light is controlled by movement of vehicles. If a vehicle does not pull up to that light and make a change to let them know somebody's there, it does create a problem. So you have to have something make that light change. And by that, you need a vehicle to approach it. So that creates the backup. So Doug, you wanna elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, Gary, you explained it pretty well and, and, and what, what you're explaining is very, uh, I'll say typical of access roads. It's one of, it's one of the unfortunate things of access roads being so close to uh, the main artery road, if you will. Um, same thing used to happen uh, on Holmgren Way, if you remember, by the Pilgrim Access Road, where Bergstrom is now located. There was an access road along there 
uh, a stop bar and the same signage was placed at that location to try and prohibit or limit, I should say, uh, traffic from plugging or, or pulling in front of that intersection as well. But you're correct, a, a vehicle needs to pull up uh, at some of these sig signalized intersections where there are loop detectors in order to trigger the, the, uh, the signal itself. Um, but there are some ways, uh, the, the signage and, and striping, like you mentioned, are, are some of the ways that can be uh, put, implemented to help, to help alleviate it, and we can look at that. Do we have the same type of signals on Cormier and Hanson? Because we have the same issues. It's the same type of intersection with the frontage road. Right. Cormier and Ashland and Han probably more so Hanson and Ashland being there yep. trucking near that area. Yes, all, all, all the intersections along uh, Ashland. Ashland Avenue, yeah. you have them at uh, Marley and Lombardi, at the Lombardi Access Road. Okay. Um, so we have this problem they, on a couple, couple very, roads. Very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Doug, in the future, how are we going to handle if, if it does become a problem like the businesses in the area are complaining about already? You know, is, is signage is signage and striping the road and making people aware of the problem going to help that, more that, so than it is at the moment? That, that's, that's going to be the first step. Gary, and to give you an honest answer tonight, uh, my honest answer would be after that, uh, we'd have to look into it further. Okay. Uh, those signals are uh, DOT signals, so it may be requesting that those be switched to uh, camera activated. Oh, okay. Uh, that would come at a cost, but that would be an option the village could look at so that you don't have to pull up to the intersection to uh, trip the uh, loop detectors that are in the pavement, you could aim the cameras further back to potentially pick up traffic further oh, back. Fr back further, okay. Um, don't hold me to that. I'm not a, a traffic expert or a traffic engineer expert, but that, that would be another option that could be looked at. Okay, well, we're looking at a situation right now where we don't know if there's going to be a problem. Uh, you know, I, it was the first thing that jumped out at me when I looked at the site plan and uh, of that little driveway. We don't know what it's going to generate yet. Hopefully it's not going to be a problem, but I want the people in that area to know within a reasonable amount of time, if it does become a problem, the, we will have some type of fix for it so it don't congest that intersection like it hopefully won't, but we'll have to wait and see. Traffic, right. you know, I always say if you don't have traffic, you don't have business but uh, sometimes traffic can be an issue in moving it too. So the let's see what happens. If not, we'll go to step two. The, the first step, I think, as, as the construction of this facility would wrap up, um, we can see the best location to place the, the stop bars and, and the signage to help uh, so that when it opens, the roadway is set uh, as much as it can be to help, help with, the, with any issue. Okay, very good. All right, if no other questions, um, I'll move to uh, approve the, uh, what are we, the ordinance uh, 010-3-2 0 -0 rezoning the uh, property at 2040 South Ashland Avenue. I'll second that. Under discussion, um, I don't know if this is appropriate here or when we're actually talking about the holiday station. Um, was a traffic study required for the holiday station coming in to kind of at least give us an idea on this and maybe some ideas on to take care of some of the concerns that Gary have and maybe again it's not appropriate with the rezone and it needs to go with the holiday station but was a traffic study required? No, a traffic study was not required uh, in this instance. Uh, I guess looking at the surrounding land uses, uh, the uh, South Ashland Avenue being a primary arterial uh, heavy traffic uh, uh, through uh, flow through area um, and we didn't see the congestion becoming a major issue as a result of this one use um, you know as traffic or as developments continue on Mike McCarthy way uh, possibly need to take a look at that um, but I, I think at this point, uh, the signage, the stop bars Doug alluded to, uh, is a good first step. And we certainly can then look for additional uh, steps if necessary. Okay, 
Any more discussion? We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 010-3-21. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 10B, action regarding ordinance number 010-1-21, adding commercial recreation indoor as a permitted use within the I-2 heavy industry zoning district. Aaron. Okay, uh, as discussed during the uh, public hearing uh, introduction, uh, this is uh, just adding commercial recreation indoor as a permitted use uh, in the I-2 heavy industry zoning district. It is a permitted use within the I-1 light industry and IP industrial park zoning districts. And the text within the code actually uh, indicates I-2 as a permitted use. It just is not reflected on the table of permitted uses. Since it seems to be just a cleanup matter, I will go ahead and recommend approval of ordinance uh, number 010-1-21, adding commercial recreational indoor as a permitted use within the I-2 heavy industry zoning district. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 010-1-21. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 10C, action regarding ordinance number 010-2-21, amending section 17-4-400, accessory uses, village of Ashwaubenon municipal code relating to accessory buildings. Aaron, you're really a popular guy tonight. Here. It's been a busy month. <laughs> um, uh, again, as discussed during the public hearing, uh, this is a result of uh, direction from the site plan review committee uh, and the code being silent on accessory buildings within the uh, commercial and industrial zoning districts uh, as well as the public use uh, zoning district. Uh, this is meant to provide direction to staff and the site plan review committee for review of accessory buildings within those zoning districts. Okay. Uh, this got quite lengthy in the site plan committee. Uh, we're throwing up sheds alongside a wrinkle tin in some of the older parts of the industrial park and it looked pretty shabby. Uh, we're trying, one I'm using as an example is in the sports entertainment district, putting up a shed alongside of a building. And you know, it just, it didn't fit. But uh, uh, they're just setting it on the ground and like Aaron says, they're using it for, uh, a cold storage, let's say. Uh, so uh, Aaron did a good job in putting this uh, new ordinance together so that there is some parameters to make sure it kind of fits. There's no such thing as really fitting, but uh, um, it's a simple way of storing things. We do uh, make sure that if they're painted decent so that they kind of blend in with the uh, interior or exterior around them. So there's no other questions. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve 01-2-21, uh, amending the 17-4-400 assessed reuse building. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 010-2-21. Any further discussion? Uh, one quick question. Aaron, will this not require then these sheds to come to site plan review? Is that what you said early on, that they'll just be covered by the ordinance and as long as they meet that, they won't have to come to site plan? I, missed, I misspoke when I said that. It will actually go to site plan review committee. Okay, so they'll still come through, but then at least to have this ordinance. Correct. Them. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 10D, action regarding requested site plan review for Holiday Station Stores, LLC, 2040 South Ashland Avenue, parcels VA-56-6, VA-56-2, and VA-56-7. Aaron. So this is the uh, site plan uh, that goes hand in hand with the uh, previously approved rezoning for the Holiday Station Stores. Uh, convenience store, uh, gas station, and car wash. Uh, as you can see up on the screen, uh, the proposed C store is located right here. As you see the cursor, car wash right here, 
uh, fuel islands right here. And again, these are vehicular uh, fuel islands. They are not for uh, semi-trailers. Uh, the property immediately to the west, that's still part of these properties, uh, is going to be held uh, vacant for now. It will be landscaped and maintained. Uh, that's uh, been a discussion point with the uh, developer throughout. Uh, there's some extensive landscaping. You can see uh, here up against the frontage road as well as up against the drive through for the car wash uh, right there. In terms of uh, recommended conditions of approval, uh, these were all uh, recommended approval, approved by the Site Plan Review Committee and Plan Commission. I'll read through, through these uh, for the record. Screen any rooftop or ground mounted mechanical units visible from the property boundaries or public right of way. All paved driveways and parking lots are required to be curbed. Prepare and submit an asbestos report to the DNR and obtain a village demolition permit prior to demo of existing buildings. No outdoor product sales except for propane. Obtain village board approval for a rezoning to a zoning district that permits convenience stores with gasoline sales. Regularly mow and maintain undeveloped grass area at west end of the property. Uh, the catch-all meet all applicable sections of 17-2-200 of Schwabenau Municipal Code. That's the site plan review requirements. Uh, engineering has been working pretty extensively with uh, holiday station stores uh, on these conditions. Uh, they've been going back and forth, few items to clean up yet. Uh, but they are making good progress on all of these, uh, including reviewing the two existing six-inch sanitary laterals, uh, identifying there's no need for a 10 foot uh, wa water easement on private property, and also including an oil water separator in uh, stormwater manhole seven and stormwater catch basin two. Uh, provide a maintenance plan for on site features. Uh, they'll actually be buying into the uh, regional pond on Ashland Avenue uh, for stormwater quality uh, purposes. Uh, from public safety, a Knox box uh, is required near the main entrance to the building. Have the subcontractors contact public safety before the install uh, of fire systems, sprinkler, fire alarm, et cetera, and coordinate witnessing of acceptance testing. Have the subcontractors submit state approved plans to public safety for fire alarm, sprinkler, et cetera. Uh, forestry recommended approving the plan as presented. Uh, from bike and ped, there was a note that two bicycle racks are identified uh, already on the site plan. Uh, staff recommendation uh, as kind of a, a best practice uh, for consideration by holiday station stores was to uh, include a masonry canopy support wraps similar to existing holiday stores at the corner of Old Hudson Road and White Bear Avenue in St. Paul in the corner of Centerville Road and Highway 96E in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Uh, just because this is one of the primary entrances to the sports entertainment uh, district, uh, dressing those up would certainly help with the uh, visual impact of the, the canopy. And again, that's a recommendation uh, that's not in our code, so that is for uh, holiday station stores to consider. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, Mr. Uh, Jim Geppner from Holiday Station Stores in the audience and a number of their uh, engineering staff are also available online. Are there any questions? One thing I would like to say, Aaron, Aaron worked with Holiday Gas Station um, to make sure that there was not a lot of stuff outside of the station and they agreed to not put things out there for sale like bags of solar salt and and firewood and stuff like that because it is the main entrance coming into our sports and entertainment district so i thank you for that there was a lot of conversation at the site plan about it uh, i wasn't really in favor of a gas station convenience store going into the entertainment district but uh through the uh, conversations we had, the conversations with the people in charge of it, uh, knowing the project that they've got going, Kitty Corner from the uh, Swan Club in, I believe that's the town of Lawrence. I think it's on the edge of the pier, but in the town of Lawrence, it is a clean looking uh, facility. Uh, hopefully it stays that way. Uh, they did add some landscaping to uh, the uh, access uh, road part to try and screen that car wash a little bit. So uh, uh, on a whole, I think it's a good plan. Anything's better than what's there right now. So I think yeah. they're doing a good job in making it look right to fit the uh, entertainment district that we're trying to enhance. And I would agree with that. I mean, I think 
I've been in that area for a very long time between my dad's business and where I live now and um, exciting to see something go in there. And um, I actually was excited that it was a gas station because there's not a close one near my current house, not where I'm moving, but um, I, I think something like that is kind of needed in, in the area at some point on the outside. So um, excited to see that happen. <clears throat> I just have a question on the accesses to Mike McCarthy, and there's two of them. And I know Aaron and I have talked about the distance that they were. I did go and look at the site. Will those driveways stay in the same place they are right now, or are they being relocated further west? Do you have an idea on that? I guess I'll probably defer to uh, to Jim on that. Could you state your name and address for the record, please? Sure. Jim Gepter, I'm the real estate development manager for Holiday. Our address is 4567 American Boulevard in Bloomington, Minnesota. And um, first off, we appreciate the opportunity to become a part of your community. And uh, we want to be a good neighbor and uh, we'll work with you in whatever way we can to make that, you know, a, uh, a, a great situation for everybody. In regards to the curb cuts, and we do have uh, uh, Glenn Harvey and Steve Harrison, who are civil engineers on the line as well. But we have those two curb cuts to create the best traffic flow on the lot and make it user friendly for the cars, you know, coming in and out. Uh, you narrow it down to one, it can make it a lot tougher situation. So that's why we have the two there. And as far as the placement of those curb cuts uh glenn or steve can you address are they going to be exactly where they currently are or is that shifting a little bit and maybe they i know I they're on believe they're, oh, they're all here, muted I'm here. Oh. I'm here this is glenn okay glenn this is glenn harvey with uh, bergman who is our civil engineer can you address that, Glenn? Yes. Um, if uh, Aaron, could you go to sheet C one zero one zero, the demolition plan? Yep. Just a second here. Yeah, I got it. Which sheet was that again, Glenn? C zero one zero demolition plan it should be sheet three of seventeen. So that drawing depicts the existing driver locations and. Um, the existing curb and gutters to be removed. So the driveways are in the same general locations. Um, let me zoom out a little bit here. So you can zoom in on the um, Mike McCarthy frontage there. You can see the driveway locations identified as Keynote 10, existing sidewalk to be removed as well as Keynote 8, existing curb and gutter to be removed. You see that on the drawings there? Yeah, it is, I can see it, it's kind of hard to see. So can you tell me, are they gonna be moving further to the west, the driveways, or are they moving closer to the intersection with the frontage road than the existing driveways? They are moving away from the intersection or further, I guess, is that further west? West, okay. Do you have any idea how many feet they are from the frontage road, approximately? I do not at this time. I can get that information though and get that to Aaron. Then Let's it see looks if I can scale that quickly. Sorry, I've got to reset the scale. Oh, That's okay. Are you measuring that out now, Glenn? Y yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. Okay. If you guys want, I can come back to that. Well, then the other question I have in regard to traffic flow is the entrance coming off of the frontage road, um, you know, with the concerns that were raised this evening about that intersection being blocked. It looked like in the diagram that that's more an access point for the gas trucks that are coming to fill the gas tanks 
do you envision that being more of what the access is rather than vehicular or vehicles going in that way? Or is that how you're designing it? On, on that, as far as the, um, the trucks, Glenn, we really envision those coming off of McCarthy, correct? Uh, no, the trucks will come in off of the frontage road and okay. then loop around behind the store. Okay. Access the USTs on the end of the canopy and then proceed out to Mike McCarthy Way. Okay. That was pretty good. So they will exit on Mike McCarthy. Yeah. Exit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And they'd exit, it looks like, to the far west driveway, it looked in the diagram that you had. Yes, I believe that's correct. So be closer to the things. There's two curb cuts off of uh, Mike McCarthy Way that will definitely help with the uh, traffic flow. And like yeah. I say, it's it's going to make it a uh, much more pleasant experience for cars getting in and out of there. So I like your sidewalk that you guys put in on the west side as well, going right up to the building outside of the traffic area and, right. and moving people safely from the sidewalk up to the building. So. Thank you. If you can't figure out the dimension, that's fine. You just get it to Aaron. I just was curious um, with the concerns with that intersection to try to keep that as far to the west as we can. And I understand that there probably is there's a need for two driveways. I I can see that, um, but with the concerns about the intersection, keeping it far back as we can. And just yes, it's about 200 feet from the yeah. from Mike McCarthy. Okay, that's what Aaron had thought. For the first. Okay. Any more discussion? Questions, comments? I would make a motion to approve the site plan as presented with the conditions elaborated upon by Aaron. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the site plan for Holiday Station Store with staff conditions. Any more comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. 10E, action on Class A beer, Class A liquor, cider only, request for True North Energy LLC, DBA True North number 810. I believe that this is, this is just kind of a transfer um, because of the sale of the station, Joel? Yeah, that is correct. They're uh, currently Airport Shell Incorporated is looking to sell to uh, would be effectively True North Energy LLC doing business as is True North number 810. Um, the issuance of this license should be conditioned upon the sale of the property so that it doesn't get transferred preemptively, if you will. Um, all the conditions of the application and the requirements uh, for the license have been met, and so uh, staff is recommending approval at this time. Move to approve the uh, Class A slash cat slash Class A liquor cider for North Energy, true North Energy. Is that conditioned on the sale, Gary? Yes. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the Class A beer, Class A liquor cider only for true North Energy dependent upon the sale. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 10F, action on Class A liquor license request for Bountiful Boards GB LLC, DBA Bountiful Boards GB. Um, Pony, I will let you take this, or Joel, or? Sure, I can uh, jump in on this. Uh, as the board may recall, last month this was in front of the board uh, concerning uh, some issues regarding the granting of this liquor license uh, essentially across the street here from Village Hall. Uh, as the board may recall, there were some concerns regarding, regarding the security of the premises and the serving and storage of uh, alcohol at the premises. Uh, so this matter was tabled to, to this month to allow the applicant time to try to uh, nail down some additional details to address uh, village staff's concerns regarding the security and storage of alcohol. There has been a dialogue uh, between 
uh, staff, myself uh, specifically, as well as uh, the applicant, Ms. Grant. Uh, Ms. Grant has provided some additional drawings, but those drawings as far as the premises uh, do not address the concerns uh, as far as the security and storage of liquor, and then also appears to expand the premises into common areas, as well as having the storage of liquor separate from the actual premises. And so based upon those concerns, I expressed to Ms. Grant that the uh, village staff's recommendation will continue to be to deny the application based upon those considerations. I can conveyed or communicated that to Ms. Grant yesterday. She indicated then she would not be appearing uh, this evening uh, and was essentially requesting a refund of her application fees. Uh, so with that being said, uh, the staff's recommendation would be to deny the application based upon those reasons uh, and for the board to take action uh, on this application to essentially resolve this item. Move to deny the Class A liquor license requested for Bountiful Board Green Bay LLC. Second. We have a motion and a second to deny the Class A liquor license request for Bountiful Boards GB LLC. I will be abstaining on this. Okay. I did go and look at it because um, I hadn't been to the shop before, but um, I would agree with what Tony has said. I was concerned about the um, cage being in a employee area that anybody can access, and I realized it was going to be locked, but the security just wasn't there and not having it right in her space either was a concern that I had. Okay. We have a motion and a second to deny any more discussion. All those in favor say aye. Yeah. Aye. Opposed? With one abstaining. All those in favor say aye. Well, I already voted. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> that goofed me up, Steve. Okay. 10G Neighborhood Investment Fund Grant Program, Berkshire Project. Joel. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, back in late September, Governor Evers uh, and his Department of Administration announced the eligibility for applicants to apply uh, towards a $200 million grant program at the state level uh, that's being predominantly funded with monies and funds that have come forward from the federal government related to COVID-19 relief. Uh, this particular program is called the Neighborhood Investment Fund Grant Program. Uh, and essentially what it is uh, meant for is to provide funding for shovel-ready projects that combat or work towards resolving some of the, the issues, the long-term uh, effects that COVID-19 <laughs> has had to a variety of different communities, more or less addressing some of those negative impacts. Uh, in reviewing that particular application and maybe the possibility of projects in the village of Ashwaubenon that would comply with the program requirements, it was identified that the Berkshire project, which is the senior housing uh, project and the workforce development housing project that has um, been approved for Mike McCarthy Way through General Capital as an eligible project towards that end. Uh, staff has been working with um, General Capital to basically put together some grant narrative that would then be uh, submitted to the state of Wisconsin for this particular project. Um, General Capital is looking to uh, attempt to acquire $3.5 million of, of that grant, of that $200 million grant program to again support the financing of their particular project. Um, this particular grant is due on November 4th and it does require the local unit of government to apply for it. So a private enterprise like General Capital would not be able to apply for it without support from the local unit of government. Hence the reason why this particular application is being presented to the village board. Um, there is no requirement for matching funds or any additional local dollars to be applied towards this particular grant project. It's, it's basically just a full, uh, full grant towards the particular program or project that's being applied for. Uh, the exception would be we do have to provide some administrative work as it relates to the project in the form of just audit and reporting back to the state on the successful implementation of the monies that are received as part of the project, of which we feel that we have the capacity to, to do to support the project. There are members from General Capital on the line this evening that could certainly answer any more specific questions that you have. 
Um, again, it is our hope that we have federal dollars that are available to us here locally, and we felt it was important to do our best effort to try to bring some of those federal dollars uh, to our local community. If they don't get spent in Ashwaubenon, ultimately they'll get spent somewhere else. So with that, I'll answer any questions that you may have. Is there any liability to the village, Joel, with this if we're the applicant on responsibility if the project doesn't go through and they use some of the money? Is there anything um, we would be liable for? Yeah, no, it, it's a, basically a reimbursing program. So certainly, obviously, the project would have to uh, be underway before any reimbursables would, would take place. Um, now, we don't necessarily expend money to be immersed by it, so yep. it would be expended through general capital before before anything happens. Is this the same project that applied for WIDA funds then as well? That is correct. They did receive those? They did. They, yeah. That is correct. So, so they, they would do. be receiving this grant on top of those WIDA funds? Correct. Yes. And we have also put a lot of a lot of our dollars out on the table for this particular project. That is correct. Yep. There are, I mean, there are TIF is, dollars that are available to them. The WIDA tax credits were be, became available to them. This is certainly another funding opportunity to support their efforts from a financing perspective. Uh, you know, I'm, I hate to say it, but this is like patting the pig. I mean, this I, I, I wasn't in favor of this project in the first place. We've given we've given substantial dollars to this particular project, and now they're going to get some additional dollars. Um, you know, I, I believe in the private sector funding these particular projects. But to receive WIDA funds on top of this particular funding, I believe using this for projects that make a, a difference in this community is something we should be doing. But, be do, but, but to be doing it here in this particular case, I don't think is the right thing for the municipality to, to be doing. Um, this, I, I cannot support this in any fashion or format. Just to make that explicitly clear. You know, the question I have going along with what Steve's saying, is it mandatory for us to approve this, to move forward for them? You know, we're, we, we, like Steve said, we've got our nose stuck really far out on this project, and, and now we have to approve some paperwork, can I say, in order for this to work? Yeah, my understanding of the grant program, the application itself must be received from a local unit of government. So it would effectively come through us, thus the reason why it's being brought forward to the board. That if this is a desire to support this project, then the board would have to support that effort. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't approve, I couldn't recommend approval of this project way back when, uh, with all the dollars the village is putting in at 100%. Uh, they get the WIDA funding, and then they're looking for this funding. To me, that's that's overboard significantly. Don't get me wrong. A project that is worthwhile for the entire community with this type of funding and utilizing that to the benefit of a Schwabana, I'm all in favor of that. But for this particular project, I've got some real, real big red flags. You know, anytime you give 100%, which we did, uh, wow. I've made my statement. I am um, Steve. I voiced those same concerns to Joel. We had discussion about this, so I do have those same concerns. There's a lot of a, a lot of public funding going into this, and and I do have concerns that they're applying for another three and a half million. So, you know, we've wanted. A senior facility, that's one of the things we've talked about, and um, I frankly think it's a good project and a good location for it. Um, so I would support them going ahead with it. The question I would have for Tony or for us is, is there a way for us to look back at our TIF agreement with them and adapt that because now there's another $3.5 million available to them for this project to make it more acceptable to us as the support for that project, because we did not anticipate them getting three, another 3.5 million for this project. And we gave, like Steve said, we gave a fair amount of money to this project. Can I we asked look? that same question, Joel. No, did you? Yeah, oh. so he can answer that. No. Sorry. Between him and Tony. I think, you know, Tony and I can certainly take team it, but, but of course, obviously we would have to negotiate that, that again with them, because we obviously came to a two-party agreement 
on that TIF development. Now we haven't had those direct conversations with General Capital. I'm not sure if they're willing to respond to that kind of inquiry tonight, but, but certainly I think the possibility is there, but it would require both parties to agree to that. You know, and Joel, didn't you say this, this has to be approved by November 15th, did I hear? Fourth. Uh, November 4th, actually, so. Fourth it yeah. was? Correct. You know, and, and here we are, our backs to the wall. You know, we, we've been, our backs have been to the wall on this a couple times already. And here we are, only, what do we got, eight days left? Yeah, it, and to be fair, it, you know, obviously the program was announced September 30th, so that was post our last board meeting. We have not had a board meeting since that time. I think we became aware of the program around mid-October finally. Uh, and so we've been kind of, and, and general capital to the to a, a greater extent has been scurrying to put together the narratives to support this project. So um, I certainly understand and, and respect and, and feel for the, the rush nature of it. Unfortunately, that I think is just in large part due to the announcement and the release of the funds at the state level. It, regardless if it was the general capital project or not, and it was some other project, we would feel the same bit of hurry in order to get this application in on time. Aaron, how long have we been fooling with this? This project has been going on for, uh, let's see, that was June of 2020. I had my first uh, conversations with uh, General Capital. But we didn't officially approve it until this year, right? Uh, that was, I believe that was December yeah. of 2020. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, um, the village will get a senior facility. And the three point, or the money is there, the federal money is there, and granted, yeah, it's a lot of public money going into a facility, but we as a community will benefit from this project. And we don't have any other senior projects right now that are shovel ready that would qualify for this. If there was, then I would agree with Steve, maybe there's something that is better that we should be looking for and supporting rather than this particular project. Um, it, you know, it meets some of the desires that we have set forth as a board. And it may not be ideal, but it does have a benefit, I think, to our community. Well, that makes me wonder, will it be shovel ready if we approve this? Well, I think this particular project, out of any project that would <laughs> somewhat meet the requirements of the grant program, this particular one is as close to shovel ready that I think we, we can get at this point. Um, could there be other projects in the future that certainly would better meet the program's requirements or some of the grant funding's intentions? Uh, certainly, uh, and, and that's certainly possible, but those aren't as close on the horizon than this particular project. I think it's more the, the shovel-ready nature of this particular project. All their entitlements and approvals are in place. Um, at this point, they just need to secure their financing and break ground. Um, and, and beyond that, there are no other projects that are as close to that, that, that outcome than, than this particular project. Well, my concern with this, I said it when, we, when it got approved, I did not vote for it. Um, from the village side of it, you know, it's over $2 million worth of land. Mm -hmm. The TIF agreement is over a million dollars. They have WIDA tax credits, and now they are looking to the grant program at three and a half million dollars. That's all taxpayer money. And whether it's from the federal government or the state government, it, it's all taxpayer money. And that is close to six million dollars of taxpayer money going into this project that we get nothing back for 20 years. Because when they pay their taxes, we refund them. So I, I'm not gonna support this, but we can take a vote on it. I'm not willing to sell, sell my soul 
for this type of development. As you've stated, Mary, um, we'd like senior housing. Yes. And that would be great. Yes. And I'm all in favor of that. But I'm not in favor of uh, selling my soul or the village's soul or allowing them to milk free money. And unfortunately, there's no such thing as free money. It's money that comes from someplace. Mm -hmm. Our taxes and that type of thing. And uh, I, I just, wow, this, Steve, I've never seen anything quite like this. Steve, if I, if I may just um, politely um, see that uh, Josh Heffron from General Capital is on the line, maybe, maybe he can provide some insight as to the desire for this particular project and, and certainly that question about the uh, negotiation of TID funds was a question that I think has been left unanswered and, and maybe he can better answer that tonight as well. Josh, are you available to respond? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great, th th uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of the, in front of the council. Um, the, the, uh, and we appreciate, we sincerely appreciate the consideration that the council is giving us on this matter. Um, the, let me back up one step and say that this project is a, a, a senior project and a workforce housing project and it is an affordable housing project. So we are restricted in the rents we can charge to tenants um, by, by the, the, set, the tax credit program. The tax credits uh, were granted to us by WIDA. It is an extremely competitive process. We were you know, fortunate to get them this year. We were the probably the last deal to be awarded the lowest scoring deal or, or what you know a low scoring deal to receive the credits. There are probably three uh, applications for every um, deal that was awarded in the state of Wisconsin. So for for this deal, there were two other communities that didn't receive uh, affordable housing projects that they desired and worked on and put in as much effort and uh, financial. Uh, financial wherewithal into the projects. Um, let me speak to the reason a little for uh, the reason for us requesting the grants and or requesting this additional grant from the state and the federal government. Um, the reason is, 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 is directly tied to the increase in construction costs that have occurred across um, all real estate developments in in you know in the country at this point so our construction costs since the time we applied for the tax credits back in december to today have increased 20 21 22 percent which necessitated us receiving or, or, or at talking to joel about um asking the, the the asking for this grant um this grant is 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 a two hundred million dollar part of a two hundred million dollar uh, pool of funds. I, I would say that it's our understanding that almost all of the tax credit deals in Wisconsin this year, and for that matter, in Illinois and Michigan, are facing gaps of this magnitude uh, because of the increased construction costs due to COVID nineteen, and as a result, the federal government is putting out dollars to help these projects get across the line. I can say um, almost you know, emphatically that if this project doesn't, isn't allowed or isn't able to apply for these um, funds, that the project is likely not to be gonna be able to move forward. And you know, it's a, $20 million project at this point due to increased construction costs. And as a result, you know, that's a loss of, 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 of the project to us and to, to the town. And I think that would be, from our point of view at least, that would be extremely unfortunate. Ashwabanon would not be receiving affordable workforce housing or affordable senior housing. And as we mentioned, I think I wasn't at the meetings back when the project was approved. It's unlikely in this coming year or you know that another project like this could be approved in Ashwabanon because of what's happened to the scoring to get the credits. So um, you know I, I I understand that that the the concern about spending taxpayer dollars on afford on, a, on affordable housing is an issue, but this is not um, 
you know, I, I get it, but it's not, we are not general capital and this project is not in an unusual situation in the state of Wisconsin or for that matter, you know, in, in the country today. And as, and as Joel said, if, you know, you know, I, I can't, I can't dis, you know, disagree or argue with the thinking of the board on, 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 you know, taxpayer dollars going to, you know, this project or another project or being for, ser served for another use. But if the village decides not to support this application for projects and this three and a half million dollars will go to another shovel ready project in the state of Wisconsin. And um, you know, happy to answer any further questions you might have. Any further questions about the the project, the 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 Section 42 program, um, the where we are in the process, et cetera. But um, this these dollars are critical to us being able to close this deal and bring affordable housing to Ashwabana. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Josh. Are you willing to renegotiate the TIP agreement? is the question that was posed to you. Oh, I, apo I apologize for not getting that. The, the, I mean, we, we would certainly be able to look at it, but the losing the, the TIF agreement would create another million two dollar hole in our project. I'm not saying it's, losing it's not, it it's all. Not, I'm not saying losing it all. I'm saying rene renegotiating it based on a 3.5 million. Yeah, I mean, I mean certainly could, we, we, we could, talk about it but the the way the way to to back up one step is the project costs tw you know 20 million dollars and we need 20 million dollars of sources to fund the project so if we take a million two away from the project or negotiate part of the tiff away we would have to you know increase our you know find the dollar somewhere else so, you know, in, in, in thinking about it off the cuff right now is one possibility is if the, you know, and I, and I say this in all seriousness, is if the city wants or the village wants to renegotiate the TIF and reduce the amount of the TIF, we could certainly try to apply and replace those TIF dollars with these grant dollars. So instead of applying, let's say we knock half a million off the TIF and reduce it to $700,000, we could certainly then increase our request to the back, to the to the neighborhood grant program by by the loss of those dollars. You know this then, this grant was just brought out in the very near future. You've got a deadline of November fourth. How did you expect to get the project off the ground if this grant didn't even come around? We, we were we were we're working with WIDA. We've approached the county for funds. Nothing has come to fruition yet. We're we're working furiously, uh, day in day out, to secure um, funds for, for, to get the project moving forward. We are facing this same situation on two projects we're working on in Milwaukee, and one project we're working on in Stevens Point. We will be applying through the city of Milwaukee for these funds on two Milwaukee deals. And the, in, in Stevens Point um, on our project, we were able to secure CDBG funds to, uh, you know, mimic the, 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 the grant program here. Joel, how much did the WIDA grant give to this project? Do you know, or Josh? I, I think Josh or Aaron would probably be a better resource. Josh, can you describe kind of the value of the, the WIDA tax credit to the project? Yeah, the WIDA tax credits will provide, we have an equity investor secured and they'll, they'll provide through the sale of the tax credits to this investor, that'll provide nine point, uh, roughly $9.2 million to the project.
I think if the, um, just to kind of give some perspective to the board then, if, if the board feels um, compelled to tie the, uh, the availability of these grant dollars to some form of a reduction in tax incremental financing, um, then I would entertain that as a component of the motion, uh, recognizing that the grant application is due by October 4th, or excuse me, November 4th, and then also recognizing the need, uh, the financing need from general capital's perspective in order to make this project successful. I think the board's intent is to reduce the overall direct local contribution through TIF funding to support the project with the effort of gathering the state or federal dollars through this grant program to support that effort. Um, and so if there's a method to apply for that additional funding to thus then reduce the overall TIF financing, that would be a condition of the approval to submit the application. Um, because we are submitting the applicant um, application on behalf of the village, if we are awarded that grant and aren't able to successfully renegotiate the terms of that agreement, being the TID agreement, then we would simply relinquish the grant award back to the state for, for that purpose. Um, but that, that's kind of the direction I, I'm getting the general feel from the board. I would, we would need some more direction through a formal action to do that. I don't know quite how to say this. They're looking for this grant to finalize their project. We renegotiate them. We're taking something away from them. How are they ever going to get that project going? I think ultimately, if, if we have $1.2 million allocated through TIF incentive, and let's say the village wants to, at best, wholly get out from underneath that, that commitment, then our application is for $4.7 million. And if we get $4.2 million, the component of the motion or the suggestion in the motion is that before that dollar amount is accepted by the state, then it would require a renegotiated TIF agreement with general capital to offset that increase in value from the grant. And Tony's probably shaking his head thinking, <laughs> what are you doing, Joel? <laughs> Yeah, and if I, Joel, Joel, if I could add here, if if I could, if I could add a couple, a thought, or or some backup information on on the way these projects are are uh, designed or structured, if that's okay. Yep. Sure. So the the money, the money isn't a, a, a windfall per se to general capital. What what we can earn and make on this project is prescribed by the section 42 and the state of Wisconsin. So it's not as though the, the money is going into our pockets. We have to, at the end of the day, um, go through what's called a subsidy layering review. And the subsidy layering review makes sure, and that's done by WIDA, make sure it, that the, the project is not oversourced. And oversourced meaning that there's more funds available to, for the project that are needed, so that so that there isn't uh, that that windfall to us, um, it's 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 just it just it just it, just, it can't happen um, because of WIDA's oversight, who you know, and WIDA is an oversight has over gets receives oversight from HUD. So it, it the money is is spent on the project, not um, you know, to general capital per se. Any more discussion, questions, comments? Um, I would make a motion to approve the grant application for the State of Wisconsin Neighborhood Investment Fund grant program to support the Berkshire Senior Housing Development Project on Mike McCarthy Way with the caveat that um, the TIF funding or the TIF agreement that we have with them, and I don't know what the best way to say is, is um, is reduced um, the amount and that's put on the grant application for the neighborhood investment fund grant program. Is that clear or not? 
Is that everybody, do I have a second? So you're saying to reduce the TIF incentive would be the negotiating part? Correct. And have them apply for a grant, including the amount that the village has put into the TIF uh, for them, for the TIF agreement with, with them. And that TIF agreement would come back to the village board for approval? Yes. Which we would have to do by next week. No. Well, oh, we'd have to wait until we got the grant, then go back and negotiate the tip. Yeah, we have a, we need to have a second before we can keep discussing this. Somebody I'll second it just for further discussion. Okay, so Allison seconded it, so we can keep talking. Um, so what you're saying, Tracy, is that okay? This originally was supposed to be for three and a half million. We had given them 1.2 million in TIF agreement, so they would probably apply for 4.7. Yeah. So what what I would suggest is because the way that the TIF agreement is structured is based on a percentage and not necessarily a flat amount. It's a percentage of value that's generated from the project, and so we could apply for any value of the grant up to the max and I'm not sure if there's a specific maximum on this particular grant application for an individual project but in any event whatever value is returned or is provided as part of the grant again there's no guarantee the grant will be awarded but if it is re awarded then I think the condition of the motion would be to review and possibly renegotiate the TIF agreement to reflect the value of the grant that's received as a result of the program. And so then we're not necessarily speaking individual dollars, but if the grant is awarded, then the village will retain the right of, before relinquishing those funds, to renegotiating the TIF agreement to reflect the value of the grant that's being received. I think at the end of the day, to me, that makes sense primarily because if this grant was available at the onset of the project, it may have dictated or changed your decision as related to the incentive that was provided because it could have been viewed as equity towards the project as a result of, of the grant. Are, are we saying that if it goes from 3.5 to 4.7, then we would renegotiate the TIF agreement? What if it stays at 3.5? What happens then? Well, then I think at this point, you would have to decide, are you going to accept the award uh, and provide that to general capital? If not, then certainly that would be no different than not receiving the award of the grant. General capital, of course, would then have to make a decision as to whether their finances align to begin the project in earnest. Uh, if the award is provided, I think the motion would provide you still with the opportunity to renegotiate the TIT agreement to reflect the value of the grant that is received, whether it's one million, three and a half million, or four point seven million. I would want it explicitly clear that if they get some additional dollars, that somehow those dollars are taken into account relative to the contribution we've made by TIF. Sure. And then that those additional dollars would result in a reduction of our TIF contribution to this project. I well, just want to make that yeah. from my perspective. That's and how I, I would see that. think kind of like what you said, whether they get 1 million, 25,000, whether they get 5 million, whatever it may be, if they are awarded anything through the grant, it comes back to negotiation on the TED. Whatever they get. Yeah, whatever they get. Because we're ultimately the ones that have to say we'll take the award, correct? Correct. So if we apply, we get it awarded. Is there any... If we don't take it, is that anything that the all of a sudden black mark against the village of Eshwab? I'm not even know how that is with other grants if you apply and then don't accept them or fulfill the grant. So uh, risk with that. I, I can't say that there is or is not. I suspect there wouldn't be. This is kind of a special program. Um, a lot of times if you look at like particular DOT grants or Knowles Nelson stewardship grants, those are continuously funded programs. And so sometimes you get kind of a black mark, if you will, or a red check next to your name if you don't accept those. But this being kind of a special program, um, you know, some of these projects, uh, although they are shovel ready, um, because of the short term nature and turnaround of the application, I think it will be difficult for people to sure. commit. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, does everybody understand the motion that they will, we will apply the grant, any excess dollars, and we will um, renegotiate the TIF agreement? Right, Joel? Correct. So any, any funds that are received, if we are awarded the grant um, prior to the award of the dollars to this particular project, that we would then essentially re renegotiate the terms of the TIT agreement to, to realize those additional dollars are being allocated towards that project. Steve, you're gonna say something. Yeah, I, I, I can't. I, I, I acknowledge and I appreciate the efforts by the board to facilitate this development, but I can't in any clear conscience, I never have supported and I never will support a 100% grant from a TIF project, noting that there aren't additional dollars generated that support other infrastructure that's necessary to support new development. I just wanna make that clear. I appreciate uh, Tracy and Allison and the rest of the board trying to make this work for all parties. Okay, does everybody understand the motion? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 10H, consider discuss act on resolution redesignating wards and creating polling places for the village of Ashwaubenon, Brown County, Wisconsin, as a result of the 2020 census. This, um, this, these new ward maps were worked on very, very hard by our GIS professional, Francine. This is about the fourth or fifth set of ward maps we have. And um, one of the maps, um, I had her um, put all of the actual census block numbers because there's a lot, you know, you move this, you got 47 people, and you move this that way, you got 12 people, and it's a lot of moving around. So you did a great job, Francine. We have three options. Can I go up there and look at them? I'm sorry, like those. What? Oh, yeah. Just it's better than what's on our t tablet, so. Yeah, they're pretty small. So, okay, I'll, Joel. And I'll do um, a little bit of kind of um, explanation as to the, the three options that are being presented tonight. And again, I wanna uh, reiterate what Mary had said. Francine did a fantastic <laughs> job. Even though what you saw were maybe six or eight maps, she probably produced 100 different options uh, in her office that we then had to work through. So I wanna thank Francine for all of her hard work and dedication towards this project. And I also wanna thank Chris Teske, Mary, Aaron Schutte, and Tony, because we, we kinda of have an internal review committee from that perspective. Uh, so ultimately what we have before you tonight are, are really kind of two options. There's an option one and an option two. Uh, I'm gonna begin with option two primarily because it, it's the easiest to explain. Option two essentially takes all of the existing wards and matches them with, with where they are today with the exception of wards seven, eight, nine, and 10. Those four particular wards needed to be modified primarily because of the county supervisory district plan that was presented. Uh, their tentative district plan had shifted the boundary between supervisory district 21 and 22 to the south to align directly with Highway 172. And so by, by right, or by, by basically effect, we needed to ultimately adjust wards seven, eight, nine, and 10 to reflect that change. Uh, we are not recommending option two, primarily because it does not tie into or take into effect future growth and the growth as a result of the 2020 census. And so part of the statutory requirements is that we take into consideration changes in population, as well as the potential and known development and growth in your community. So option one uh, ultimately is broken down into option A and B. 
All of the wards have had some minor adjustments to them to reflect that change in population from the 2020 census and future growth. So option 1A is essentially our effort to uh, make sure that the existing trustee districts are all kept in and maintained. Um, we did have some challenges as a result of the supervisory district's tentative plan shift where we ran into some problems with numbering districts or, or wards 7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, and so option 1, uh, 1A preserves essentially every ward uh, seat to date. Now the challenge with 1A is that it splits a trustee district between two supervisory districts. So if you look at uh, Jay, for example, he's ward 7 and 8. Um, or um, um, Steve, you're 9 and 10. Right now, um, uh, under 1A, essentially Ward 7 is in Supervisory District 21, Ward 8 is in Supervisory District 22. And that condition exists today, but what it does create is an administrative challenge for election officials, because ultimately at a spring election, for Ward 7 and 8, there's two different ballot styles for that individual trustee. There'll be a, ward, a ballot style for Supervisory District 21 and a ballot style for Supervisory District 22 for the same trustee. So it's imperative that the election inspectors are issuing the correct ballot based on the location of where that resident resides. Uh, nine and 10 is in the same boat. It's split between the two and so there's two different ballot styles. Um, one thing I will note on both option 1A, 1B, and technically option 2, the prior ward map had uh, a challenge with the school district um, between Ashwaubenon and West De Pere. We've corrected that discrepancy so that a whole ward will reside, or I should say a school district will reside only within one ward. And by doing that, that eliminates an additional extra ballot style that is unnecessary. Again, creating administrative challenges for election inspectors. Option 1B effectively is the same as 1A with the exception of how Ward 7, 8, 9, and 10 are laid out. We did not take into consideration in option B where the trustees live. And so by doing that, effectively what you do is you can keep wards seven and eight in supervisory district 21 and wards nine and 10 in supervisory district 22, effectively eliminating that duplicate or that dual ballot styles between each trustee. But what it does do is it displaces at least one of our trustees coming up at the next election because effectively they'll be residing in uh, one of the other existing trustee seats. Now that was a goal, a local criteria that the board had established earlier, and so we did our best to uh, deviate that. At the end of the day, between option 1A or 1B, it, uh, staff feels that they're both adequate. Uh, certainly 1A provides an opportunity to maintain the existing trustee seats separate but it does create kind of some administrative challenges with ballot styles. Option 1B, again, eliminates the administrative challenges of different ballot styles, but creates that kind of dichotomy where you have trustees that now are seated, could be potentially seated against each other at an upcoming future, at the next upcoming election. Uh, so with that, we'll answer whatever questions you have. Francine does have a, a litany of data that we can pull up. Um, but as, as Mary had mentioned, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this is my first time in, in my 20-year career where I got to be involved in redistricting. So uh, I learned a lot from Francine and from staff. And I, I found it interesting how census blocks are created. And um, you know when you start thinking about gerrymandering and how how some of these wards take shape, it, it can be very difficult given the shape and structure of census blocks. So it's, it's an amazing puzzle and I'm glad you were doing it because I'm terrible at jigsaw puzzles and Francine did a great job. So with that, we'll answer any questions you might have. Uh, you mentioned administrator uh, work on 1A. How much work is there in stay with this one? 
Uh, so 1A, it, it essentially for those two particular trustee seats, so the supervisor that or trustee that sits in 9 and 10 and the trustee that represents 7 and 8, there would effectively be two different ballot styles for each of those trustees. So you might have in a spring election um, two different ballot styles only because the trustees are split between those supervisory districts at your polling location. And so the election inspector, when I come to the polling place, I state my name and address for the record. Me as the election inspector, I need to be fully aware of where that person resides so that they are issued the correct ballot based on their ward, even though they have the same trustee because they'll have different county supervisors. And so just, it, it, again, it, it's doable. It can be done. In fact, it's, our present scenario has that in our current ward plan. It, again, just creates challenges for election inspectors. And ideally, if you can avoid it, you would, just because it, it creates that, that challenge. So it's strictly at election time is when there is an administrator work. Correct. Okay. And we're and we're doing some of that right now, you're saying. We are, correct. Okay. So option one B basically mirrors um, option two, but it just they just have two trustees that are gonna be residing in that district, correct? Uh, just to, to clarify 1B matches 1A uh, with the exception of the numbering sequence of the wards. So the actual kind of trustee districts, if you will, or the wards stays exactly the same. We just numbered them differently to maintain the trustee ward relationship. It's basically what side of 172 are you on? <laughs> if you're on... Yeah, ones, it if you, uh, and I, yeah. we could maybe bring this up too on the screen, but if you look at 1B, 7 and 8 is north of 172. Under 1A, uh, 7 and 9 are, are, invert, are converted, are flipped over. So it's 9 and 7 mm. and 10 and 8. But they're, they're exactly the same size, size and, and um, area, census blocks, it's just the numbering has changed in order to attempt to maintain um, really Jay's seat at Ward 7 and 8. So Jay resides just south of 172. So if he's going to maintain his ward relationship in Ward 8, he would need to, we would need to split his trustee district, if you will. And then Steve, you're in Ward 10, so we would need to maintain your Ward 10 and then put nine above 172. Whereas here you have J and U both in wards nine and 10. You know, if that makes the most sense, I, I think what we really have to do here is what makes the most sense versus what prevents two trustees from, you know, basically going into a, the similar ward situation. So from my perspective, I'm all in favor of what makes the most sense for the village, not, not necessarily myself as an elected official. So. I also like the idea. So <laughs> I've been in the 7 8 split over 172. And I mean, as much as I was a child when that was happening, once I got older and kind of understood, it just didn't make sense. <laughs> you know, they're. Different, we're the same school district in Ashwaubenon, but you have Valley View Elementary in one, you have Pioneer Elementary in the other. Um, I just always felt like the trustee was probably more cognizant of what was going on on that side of 172, it, and, and not on purpose by any means, but I think it just kind of happened. So I like the idea, and I, again, too, for the next 10 years, Potentially making it easier on our on our elections and things like that. I, I do kind of like the flow of that a little better, in my opinion. But I will be done soon. So yeah, I would agree with Allie. I think having a ward split.
by 172 is it's a big difference between north of 172 and south of 172. So I would prefer C9 and 10 south and then 7 and 8. So 1B I think would be a better option. Um, and Steve said it would be okay with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said it first, Steve. <laughs> you know, it, from my perspective, it makes the most sense. Yeah. If it makes the most sense, that's what you got to do, you know. Okay, does somebody want to make a motion or are we still discussing this? You don't want the trustees to be going across Highway 172 at Babcock to get their constituents. I, I mean, know. There's, there's a great propensity there. I feel being like run we're over. talking about this great <laughs> divide through Ashwabana, yeah. but really it's a highway. So, yeah. um, given that it seems to be that we're all in general consensus, I will make a motion to approve Ward Map 1B as the village ward map for the next till the next census i don't know if that's acceptable i'll second that okay does everybody understand the motion it's ward map 1b any more okay i'm sorry resolution approving ward map 1b that yeah that that Okay. At, at your day off spot, Tony had provided you a copy of a resolution oh. that would effectively be adopted uh, for one of the three map options. So you would, they're all, the, they're all numbered the same. However, just pay attention to obviously the header where it says option 1B. Uh, within that resolution, obviously the polling locations are identified. Now those would need to be effectively codified by ordinance which we would do at the next meeting based on the approval of this plan. And then the respective ward boundaries are identified uh, in, uh, very specifically in word form within the resolution as well. So that was something that was worked out between Francine and, and Tony. And then ultimately the map uh, that Francine has prepared as well and that uh, you see in the back of the room will be also attached to the resolution. And it's part of the process, once that's approved, that will be then transmitted to the county for them to complete their final steps. Okay, does everybody understand? It's resolution R10-3-21, map 1B, and the description, I'm not gonna read it. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Thank you, Francine, for all your work, Joel, Tony, Chris. Okay, 10I, TDS Telecom presentation outlining potential underground fiber optic construction throughout the village of Ashwabnan. Doug Martin. Yes, I'll introduce it while Jeremy gets a couple items uh, set up up front. Uh, in late September, uh, the village was contacted by TDS Telecom uh, in early October. I had a meeting with TDS uh, whereby they informed the village and, and really a number of communities in the Green Bay area, including Green Bay, uh, that uh, through their market research, uh, they have selected uh, this area to expand their fiber network uh, to provide various services to uh, residential neighborhoods in the Green Bay area. Uh, Josh Worrell is here from TDS Telecom to uh, provide an overview kind of, of their service and what uh, providing the service in an existing neighborhood or existing community uh, means. Uh, this is the first step to kind of bring you up to speed as to what uh, TDS Telecom is looking to do. Uh, there will be subsequent meetings between the, the village and TDS moving forward. You'll probably hear a number of other communities having similar meetings. Uh, just figuring out how these expansions work and how to permit them and inspect them in accordingly. With that, I'll turn it over to Josh. Good evening. Thank you for Good having evening. me here tonight. Um, I'm Josh Morell. I'm manager of business development for TDS Telecom. Josh, and could you pull the mic up a little bit? How's this? Back. I'm here tonight to uh, go over an overview of TDS, history of TDS in the telecommunications space, as well as present um, an overview of our project and plans for the greater Green Bay, Green Bay area, as well as Ashwaubenon. So TDS is a Fortune 1000 company. We've been in business for over 50 years. Uh, we started as a 
small rural phone company. Uh, so we're publicly traded, but we're family owned by the Carlson family. Uh, Roy Carlson went around the country buying up small ILEC properties. ILEC is incumbent local exchange carrier. It's just the legal designation, meaning that we're the phone company in, in that given property. So any given community has usually two telecommunication providers, uh, one cable company and one phone company. Um, so we across the United States and about 34 states are the phone company um, in a lot of different uh, smaller communities from islands off the coast of Maine to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and everywhere in between. Um, you'll see that we roll up to the TDS holding company and we have sister companies such as US Cellular, One Neck and Subtle Strauss. And then you'll see some of our accolades as an employer there as well. This is an overview um, of our footprint. Um, so the blue, those are our, our ILEC properties. Uh, that's where we're the incumbent phone company. And the red um, is our cable property. So we're the seventh largest ILEC provider in the country. And while that may sound impressive to give you some perspective, um, the discrepancy between us at number seven and AT&T at number one is ginormous. So in the telecom world, we're doing about a little over a billion dollars of revenue a year. And that's, that's small in telecom terms. So we're, we're a large company, but in the telecom world, we're fairly small. Um, in 2013, we started buying cable companies. So you'll see there in the red, um, our stance was in, let's be the best broadband provider in any given community, regardless of technology. And buying cable companies was a great way for, our, uh, for TDS to continue to organically grow. The issue is, is we ran out of cable companies to buy. You'll see in today's environment, um, most of the merger and acquisitions in the cable plant area, the Time Warner Charter acquisitions, multi-multi-billion dollar um, acquisitions and mergers, and that's just not a pool TDS can play in. We sit in the 50 to $350 million acquisition range, and the companies that are available to buy in that range are um, would need extreme market reinvest or network reinvestment to bring those networks up to speed, and at what at that point, you might as well just build your own network, and that's kind of what we've started doing. So we took two fiber deployment. We switched from cable and went back to fiber. Um, we took two fiber deployment strategies. We went back to all of our existing ILEC properties and where it was economically um, feasible, we overbuilt our existing copper plant with fiber. And this is a fairly aggressive approach. Um, we were taking an existing copper asset that was servicing people with video broadband and phone products, and we were essentially throwing it in the trash can to upgrade to fiber. Um, that's, that's a fairly aggressive move for a telecommunications companies to take. Um, but everywhere we did that, we had tremendous results. We had 50% take rates, um, our service, uh, the way we provided service and our uh, troubleshooting calls went down because they were brand new networks. Um, and one of the stats I'll point out here was our net promoter score, um, which is how they rank telecommunication providers was 40. To give you an idea, cable companies generally average around five. Um, so these were tremendous new networks and pretty much everywhere we went and we did this, we saw tremendous results. And that gave us the idea of what if we went to a community that had no brand recognition of TDS. They did not know who we were when we were not one of the incumbent providers and we overbuilt the municipal limits with fiber optic to offer a competitive choice for TV, phone and internet products. Um, so we trialed that in a community called Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. That's a suburb of Madison. Um, it's where our main corporate office is. Um, it's a town of about 10,000 households um, and about 30,000 people. And Sun Prairie was building their own municipal network. Um, but due to capital restraints, it was going to take them about 12 to 15 years to, to complete. We ended up partnering with them to purchase their existing access or assets and what they had started. Um, and then we... Uh, built it out in 15 months. And in that 15 month time span, by every metric we can measure Sun Prairie by, it was a tremendous success. Um, we now have over 60% market share in Sun Prairie. Um, and it's not only great for all of the TDS customers in that, in that particular community, um, but it's great for everybody who stayed with their current provider because the incumbent cable provider, four months after we started building, upgraded everybody free in the community to 100 meg. And then another four months later, they upgraded everybody free to 200 meg. And then they started competing with us on price. Um, so the, what we learned from the Sun Prairie experience was first, 
Um, there's this thirst for broadband um, and fiber specifically, and second, that competition is powerful. And pretty much everywhere we go, we've seen this competitive threat. And so we like to say this is going to be great for not only everybody that becomes a TDS customer, but it's going to be good for those who decide to stay with their current providers. This is just a slide. I won't. I won't. Um, talking about the benefits of fiber, I won't <coughs> read this to you. I'll just point out a few of the facts. Uh, Interesting facts, there's a lot of studies that say that fiber to the home increases home values by up to 3.1%. And then the big buzz term that's thrown around the country right now is future proof. And it's essentially what that means is once we put the fiber in the ground to the homes, uh, the capacity of the pipe is unlimited. So while today we might be offering upwards of one to two gig speeds with entry level speeds of 300 meg, 10 years from now, if residents need five gigabit or 10 gigabit speeds, um, the pipe is in the ground and we will be able to provide those speeds as technology and, and bandwidth demands grow as technology continues to progress. So why Ash, why Ash Wabadon? Uh, we're looking for communities that are, have good household growth, good household demographics, and are underserved by their incumbent providers. And the way we describe underserved is a little different than maybe the federal grant programs in broadband uh, describe them. Um, if you talk to residents in all of the communities that we've done this, you'll hear the same story over and over and over again, which is, yep, we have two providers, but I really only have one choice because the one provider is underinvesting and they don't have the speeds I need or the products I need for my, my um, at home. Um, so we look for communities like that and we target communities like that to continue to grow. So this slide is to talk a little bit about the impacts of construction and in full transparency, um, this is disruptive to communities. There is no way, I believe Ashwaubenon is about 115 miles of fiber covering about 9,500 service addresses, commercial and residential. There is no way to put 115 miles of fiber into the ground and not turn a few residents' heads. Um, one of our biggest learnings, and we'll talk about this in, in a few slides later, um, early on in the construction process, we figured out pretty quick that residents don't distinguish between public utility easements, street right of way, and their yard. They only see that we're, we're digging in their yard. And we took a pretty aggressive approach four years ago when we started these fiber programs in that, you know, we had a statutory right to access those utility areas. Um, and we pretty much just went <laughs> and started construction. And we learned fairly quickly that the educational curve um, has to be pretty severe to let residents know what's going on in their community, who we are, and what we're doing there. And we have taken that approach. Um, but I have this slide here just to show these are the two basic um, types of construction to build fiber networks. Um, you either bury it in the ground using directional bore or missile rigs, or you hang it on the existing poles. Um, and for this particular community, a majority, I would say 90% or even more, will end up being buried in underground. Um, so just full transparency, we've done this about 20 communities in Wisconsin. Um, residents do complain. It is disruptive. Uh, we, and we'll cover some of this here, we put together a pretty robust system to turn them back to CBS <coughs> so we can address those issues on a person, person by person basis. Um, but again, we like to describe it as a short-term pain for a long-term gain. And sometimes when I tell communities it's a two-year build to get this done, that doesn't seem real short. Um, but this is an extreme long-term investment for TDS. We're planning on being here for the next 50 years. Um, so while it might take two years to roll out this network, um, and that is disruptive and difficult, once it's in place, we're here forever and we're, we're a service provider to the community forever. And so that's kind of the approach we're taking as we continue to roll out these networks. This is a slide detailing the infrastructure that you will actually physically see in the community. Most of the network will be underground, um, but on the far left there, those are what we refer to as node cabinets. Um, there will be five of those, four, four. There'll be four of those in Ashwaubenon. They service about 3,000 customers uh, per cabinet. Uh, they're like a really large beer fridge. We will work with your public works department to find locations for those. There is some flexibility on where we can place those as they are the most the largest piece of infrastructure that we'll have to place to deploy the network. Um, 
we want to find good locations for these. Once they're set, they cannot be moved. Um, they cost about 300 grand a pop to move if they have to move. Uh, we would prefer not to do that. We would prefer to find them safe homes um, back away from street right of way where people cannot hit them with cars um, and that they can you know, continue to operate and serve the community. Um, in the middle there, uh, you'll see there's two types of access points. Pedestals are above ground access points. So maybe today in your neighborhoods in, you'll see the cable or phone <coughs> providers, they have pedestals that those are the access points where they run drops from that point to the home to actually offer the service. Um, and then on the far right there, you'll see what's called a handhole, and that's a flush mount handhole um, that's below grade <laughs> access point. When we're building these networks, if we can access public utility easements in the backyard where the current providers are today, we will place above ground pedestals next to um, the existing incumbent providers pedestals. Oftentimes, because of the way certain public utility easements are platted or trees, fence lines, what have you, we have to go to the street right of way, which means we're actually installing access points in people's front yards. In those cases, we will use the handholds um, because they're more aesthetically pleasing. When we first started these builds, uh, we had quite a few communities where we put pedestals in people's front yards and that did not go over well. And about the third time I was pulled in front of a city council to talk about the towers and people's front yards, we decided there had to be a better way. And so we went to the flush mount handholds and in every community we've done that since, um, we've had good results. And that will be the same here in Ashwaubenon. But that is just a look at the <coughs> access points that we will typically use when rolling out the network. So I'll talk a little bit about our communication. Um, and education for the community and residents, um, we over communicate as much as possible. So when we permit and get a permit from the city that kicks off for, and we'll talk more about this, a neighborhood, we're doing construction in neighborhoods at a time, that kicks off a notification process where we will mail every person in that community or in that neighborhood this notification letter. It's Commonly, frequently asked questions with a little bit of marketing in there generally, but just explaining who we are, what a public utility easement is, what a street right of way is, um, and just gives us contact information for them to reach back out to us. This is our construction notification postcard. It's purposely branded obnoxious yellow and black because we don't want people to throw it away with their junk mail. Um, we want them to look at it. Um, it provides a number on there that goes straight to our triage team, which is a cross-trained cross uh, segment of our call center that can answer construction-related questions as well as sales-related questions. Um, so this piece goes out to everybody in the village as well. Our contractors will be hanging door hangers and not, well, they'll knock on every door. If nobody's home, they'll hang a door hanger on the doorknob. If they're home, they'll give it to them in person. Um, it's the same, it's the exact same thing as the postcard, same information, as well as our number to reach us if they have questions or concerns about construction. Some communities allow these, others don't. Um, these are like the small ADT security yard signs, and as our construction crew comes through and finishes in an area, they'll stick one of those in the, the front yard of, um, of the resident. Again, all the same information, so if they're wondering, why is my grass all torn up here? Oh, here's a sign, TDS, let's call them so we can get this fixed. And then those contractors will set out sandwich boards um, that will dictate all the same information and they will set those up at the either around their trucks or at the beginning of a subdivision or the ends of streets, depending on what makes most sense um, as they're out there constructing. You can go to tdsfiber.com and we have a ton of information on our construction tab. Um, there's videos about what construction looks like um, during and after the process. It explains a little bit about um, education on what the public right-of-way is, what public utility easements are, et cetera. So we, we try to push people there as much as possible if they're looking for more information. We cover the customer service triage team. This has been huge for us because when customers call in or residents call in, we report and track those tickets until they are resolved. So. Um, Resident A calls in and their front yard is disturbed and they wanna know when we're gonna come back and fix it. We will open a ticket, that ticket will be pushed to our contractors and it won't be closed until that issue is fully resolved. 
we can report out of the system as well. So if we start to see patterns of construction behavior in a given market, we can talk about that at a high level and make adjustments throughout the construction process. This is a little bit of the marketing you'll see. Um, we like to say that we out local our competition. So you'll have a local sales and field marketing team here. They will invest in any city activity going on, all not-for-profit activities here in town, any chamber events that are happening, your strawberry fests, your corn and brat days during the summer. We're gonna sponsor and be a part of those and set up booths. Um, we also partner with local businesses throughout the community um, to co-brand with, um, to start to build our brand and awareness of who TDS is and what we're offering in the community. A little bit about our products and services. This is a little bit outdated, but generally everybody cares about broadband. Um, our entry level speed is 300 meg symmetrical, so that's 300 meg up, 300 meg down. We offer 600 meg and a gig. And in Ashwaubenon in the greater Green Bay area, we will be um, deploying our XGS Pond technology, which will allow us to do two gig residential service. So we'll do everything from 300 meg all the way up to two gig symmetrical. We also have a TDS TV Plus is a cloud TV IPTV product. Um, so it's full video lineup, everything from skinny bundles all the way up to premium channels and everywhere in between. Um, and then of course we offer uh, phone service as well. This is an example, oop, excuse me. <clears throat> this is an example of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, we are currently building there as well. Uh, town of about 30,000 people, or excuse me, 30,000 households, um, quite a few people. This is just to demonstrate how we break up communities. Uh, we break them up into what we call DFNs. Those are just those little polygons there. Um, it's, they're broken up through the engineering process. When we detail engineer Ashwaubenon, we will break the community up into these little polygons. You'll be able to go onto our website, type in your address. It will show you the little neighborhood that you're part of. Um, and then we actively track um, whether you're in the, your neighborhood's in the permitting process, in construction, or construction is complete or if your area is turned up for service and you can actually order service. These DFNs are critical to us because we everything ties back to, the, to these for us. We permit at the DFN level, so we actually submit staking sheets by neighborhood to um, your public works department. Um, there are about two to 300 households. We construct and restore by neighborhood before we move on to the next area of the community. When construction moves out of a DFN or polygon or neighborhood, our sales team comes in behind them and we pre-sale the market so that we are turning up neighborhoods as we work through your community. So depending on where we start, that area of the community may get serviced three to four months after construction starts, but there may be other areas of the community that may not get serviced for two years. So it's a, we roll it out as we construct and go, and we're pre-selling and incentivizing um, customers to sign up for service as we build our subscriber base as we construct. This is an overview of the whole Green Bay area of what we're targeting. It's about, excuse me, it's about 1,100 miles um, upwards of a $200 million capital investment to cover the communities you see there in front of you. Ashwaubenon, as I said earlier, is about 115 miles of fiber, covering about 9,500 households, somewhere between a 12 to $15 million capital investment um, to build out this network. Questions? I know that was a lot. Um, <laughs> these meetings are typically a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. Um, a lot of information, but I'm happy to come back and answer any questions if you don't have them here today. My biggest concern is going to be how it's going to be presented to the neighbors because <clears throat> it is very disruptive to the neighborhoods, and um, I don't think it's fair that we would have to take those complaints at our office, so hopefully we'll have your cell number that we can give to the people. Um, but, Doug, did you have anything to say? This, getting the information to the village board was the first step tonight. Um, Josh is absolutely correct in everything that he said. Uh, per state statutes, within right away, it's, it's allowable. Uh, he's also correct that 
um, installing a fiber network in an existing area is extremely disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, think of a water main project going through the entire village in two years. That's gonna get people's attention and it's gonna get every board member's attention. And uh, quite frankly, the, the number of permits, the inspections, diggers hotline locates, things of that nature is something unlike we've ever seen here at the village. Meaning that the first steps in this process are going to be discussing uh, liabilities, uh, how this can be managed <coughs> within the village and discussing that with TDS, our legal counsel administration, uh, because Mary's absolutely correct and every one of you is, is probably thinking the same thing. When the calls start coming in, where do they go? When WPS, when Time Warner Cable, when everybody's doing work, the people call the village. That's, that's where they go and the people will be calling the village on this and it, it will be an inundation and there's going to have to be a process set up to handle this. There's also going to be a process and a service by which the permits can be reviewed, uh, by which the inspections can be done. Um, Steve and I have been contacting some of the other communities that have had this work done in just to, to get the, the scope of, of what's being done. And uh, we'll be working through that and kind of keeping you involved as we discuss further with TDS. Um, I'm not a I'm not a tech person, as you can tell by looking at me. Um, but people are very excited for having this type of technology in the area. Uh, but installing it is going to be very disruptive to the community. That isn't putting down anything. That's just stating fact. And and we have to put a lot of planning up front as to how this is going to be managed. Uh, and working out agreements with TDS as to how that is funded and how that is how that is done so that we don't have or that we minimize as many issues as we can. So this is the, the first dipping of the toe into the water and we'll be uh, <coughs> working through this with, like I said, with administration and, and legal over the coming months. I assume that the underground is all gonna be um, board rather than Doug or majority of it. That's correct. And just to add to what Doug was saying, he, he is correct. Um, the metaphor of the, the water throughout the uh, municipality is correct, except we're, we're not going to be at eight feet and we're not putting in, you know, a giant water main. It's going to be an inch and a quarter pipe um, that gets pulled throughout, throughout the community. So it is still disruptive, not quite as disruptive as that. I will add that we've been trying to collaborate closely with all the municipalities in the greater Green Bay area. A few weeks ago, we had a kickoff meeting with your village staff, um, which we invited anybody who had wanted to come. We brought our contractor, which is gonna be Tilson. Um, they're currently building Appleton for us, by the way, and they're, um, they're very good. Um, they're not perfect, TDS is not perfect. They're a very good contractor. Um, we had them come up here for a kickoff meeting. We brought, it was probably 30 people from our TDS core team and we presented an overview of the project to your village staff, um, and the communication will only continue from there. We'll set up weekly meetings with our local construction staff um, to continue to address the, um, the village's concerns. You might not have my cell phone number, um, but you'll have my email address, and of course our local construction staff can, you know, we'll phone call away. Um, we will escalate any issues um, to make this as least intrusive as possible. How, how deep are your lines, your conduit? <clears throat> So it varies by municipality. Um, generally, we follow the um, NES rulings, which is somewhere between eight, we, 24 inches, 18 to 24 inches is across the board, generally where we are in the state of Wisconsin. It varies by community, um, but in general, that's kind of where we're at. I would take it, I would take it your, your uh, television services. Um, those do play cable TV revenues to the village then, I take it? That's correct. So we file a statewide franchise with the state of Wisconsin, uh, which says that we remit 5% of video revenue to any municipality that we offer service in. Um, if we steal a charter customer, that's a net zero, or cable customer, that's a net zero for the village. Um, but generally speaking, we steal about, or earn 13 to 15% of the satellite community, um, which they do not remit 
uh, video franchise revenue to the villages. So, so it's a new new source of revenue. It's it's a marginal new source of revenue for you. Okay. Yes. Do you have a date when you're going to be starting this? Or I'm sure there's a lot of things to work out yet, but do you have an anticipated start date? Uh, spring of 2022, uh, whenever the ground thaws. You know, with all the boring that I've been seeing over the last number of years, I'll just say, so what you're telling us is you're going to start all over again. <laughs> boring through the city. Correct knowing we've been bored through several times already. Okay. Well, yes, in order to install this network, we will have to directional bore um, to place conduit to pull fiber through. <clears throat> How well do you camouflage your, let's say utility boxes that you do your main conjunction in? We're seeing more and more of them sticking up here and there uh, on properties and they're not an attraction to the properties by any means. Do you camouflage these somehow when you put, I've noticed your uh, pr larger boxes, do you put uh, shrubbery or anything around them to camouflage them? <clears throat> so the pedestals, which are the above ground access points, if we use place those near the existing pedestals, if that's the design, um, we will not physically place um, shrubbery around those, but residents often do. The flush mount handholes, which uh, if I had to guess would be the majority of the access points that are gonna be placed in the community, they have green tops and they're flush to grade. And so unless you physically, once the grass is growing in someone's yard, unless you physically walk up on it and you're within three feet of it, you can't really see it. Yeah, I, that I understand. It's the big boxes I'm concerned about because I don't think it's the, the uh, residence problem to uh, camouflage them. I the, think that should the, be your responsibility. The big boxes, though, there will only be four. Pardon? The big boxes, there will only be four. I know there's only four, but somebody's going to get stuck with it. Oh, excuse me, you mean the nodes. We can, we can work with the community uh, to, we can work with that. Yes, we have in the past. I, I, I thought we were talking about the access points for individual residential. No, 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 no. I'm the four, that, the that four node cabinets. Box, yeah, yeah. We we can work landscaping depending on the locations, and we can collaborate with the village on the location of those. They're flexible within a certain radius to make sure we find the appropriate location, and then depending on the location that it's in, we can talk about landscaping. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. More to follow. Thank you oh, for yeah. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Like we said, the next step in this process will be meeting with administration, with legal, with Josh at TDS, with their team to start the process of um, discussing just how this can be managed and overseen. What kind of startup date is on this? Spring of spring of 2022. 2022, okay. Doug, I have a question. How much work do you anticipate for your department? I mean, you and Steve are already swamped. Are you concerned about this or do we need extra staff or how are you gonna handle all this? That's what our next discussions are going to be. Okay. Uh, to be quite honest with you, we, this, this far outpaces anything we've we've seen. Um, the communities that we've talked to, it's gen generally. I'm speaking generally here, so I'm I'm prefacing that it's it's roughly two to three hours when construction is happening. Two to three hours each day going through on this project alone. That you will be putting in. That that somebody would have to put in. So wh where I'm going with this is. Correct. Steve and I will not be able to manage this project. We are, we're going to have to work with a with a firm, if you will, yeah. that, that can that can oversee it and assist us. Same thing with Digger's Hotline locates. When Digger's Hotline locates, if you can imagine, when they uh, Josh was mentioning a DFN area, when that's called in, that's going to be a number of locates in an area. Yeah, and we do our water ones, right? We do. Correct. Okay. We 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 just don't have the staff to do something of of this volume. So there's going to have to be a discussion in terms of 
how is it managed? How are the permits reviewed? The design oversight, uh, the construction oversight, the locates, working that out and, and those costs out and, and kind of that administration with TDS and, and how we do that. There's a number of other communities in the Green Bay area that are gonna be having these same discussions. Uh, Tilson, I believe that is the contractor for Ashwaubenon. They are also doing, I believe, uh, Bellevue and Green Bay, I think. So there might be some discussions if there's a firm or firms that can assist in doing so. We don't have those answers yet. We're, as you can tell, we're still a little in shock. And so it's, it's a matter of just getting that information and kind of having, starting those discussions. Thank you. So just to add to what Doug was saying, it's not uncommon um, that cities would reach out for firms to have help with this, engineering firms to help with permitting, help with inspection. Um, so far, Swamico, Alloway, the Pier have all hired engineering firms. Um, we're happy to have conversations with Doug and the village. Um, our, our approach to this is let's let's cover the city's costs. Um, you know, we're not if, if whatever the permitting fees need to be to cover the costs to uh, manage this project uh, efficiently. Um, we're happy to do that. So we've we've had those conversations with thus far Swamico. They're partnering with MCE. Um, We've had great conversations with them, but we can we can take those offline. But um, we understand it's a, it's a big lift for all these communities, and uh, we'll we'll come to the table and help with that in any way that we can. Okay. Doug, one question for you. I've had conversations with uh, Steve about this in boring in general. When a boring machine accidentally hits a object, I'll keep it open. Does that take up any of your time as staff to take care of that problem? If, if a water main, sanitary sewer, or storm sewer is hit, uh, yes. It uh, does take staff time. Yes, the, the water main is the one that's noticed first because when a water main is hit, uh, it lets you know right away and yeah. creates a pretty good sized mess. Same thing with uh, WPS gas. Uh, those are generally the two that show themselves the quickest. Uh, storm sewer and sanitary sewer, usually what happens is a resident will call in um, mentioning that they have a blockage or something seems to be happening and they can't flush their toilets as much or they're getting backups, things like that. The lateral is televised and all of a sudden it's noticed that something has been bored through the lateral. Um, all of those things, the, the investigations to find that out uh, Take, take time. Okay. But that becomes your responsibility then, right? To have, make sure it gets repaired. Correct. Okay. The ones that are found out later on, uh, we, we've had some recently where there have been some laterals that have been bored through. You end up calling in Digger's Hotline to find out who actually did it, and then you go back to work, work through the, the repair and who's responsible for it, yes. Okay. Any more comments? Thank you, Josh. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, 10J, review and action regarding resolution number R10-2-21, <coughs> resolution of the Village of Ashwaubenon accepting the donation of utility and roadway improvements for the phase two planned unit development, PUD overlay zoning district, title town district development. Doug. Okay, uh, what this resolution is uh, in regards to uh, the second phase of Title Town uh, construction started in, in 2019, uh, spanned 2019, 2020, early 2021, uh, more or less reconstructing Brookwood Drive from Ron Wolf Way down to Marley Lane, reconstructing all of the utilities, redoing the roadway. A pretty unique project in the village in which a, a, an entity comes in and reconstructs the entire roadway for you and then donates it back to you after it's done. Um, if you remember when the PUD was created for this area, uh, the designs were done to village standards. The roadway design is, is done to uh, the standards of the development. Uh, if anybody's driven through the area, it's, it looks very nice as they're wrapping it up. What, uh, where we are right now is there are two main contracts, if you will, on the Title Town Phase Two development. 
Uh, one contractor has finished the office building, I'll call it, and all the underground utilities and roadway, and we're responsible for that, was responsible for that. Then there is the apartment complex that is being built currently. So all of the utilities are in, the road is in, a majority of the sidewalk and, and road features are completed, and we can accept all of the utilities and the roadway as it is right now. Uh, there's an attached punch list so that that contractor can finish out the punch list and then they are closed out. And then there's almost a transfer of responsibility to the next contractor who is doing the work on the apartment complex. And we have a second walkthrough, if you will, a second punch list when they're complete to go through the entire rest of the development uh, to bring that to completion. So having said that, all the utilities are complete for the development, are tested. Uh, we've gotten the as-built drawings so we can put it on our GIS system. Uh, everything is set there. The road construction uh, up to this point is, is complete and accepted and we've, we've done walkthroughs on that and we can recommend uh, approval of this resolution. Again, once the apartment complex is complete and uh, there is some townhome construction, I believe it is, between Ori and Marley on the south side of the road that is yet to be completed. Once that's completed, another swath, if you will, through that area, another walkthrough is done, another punch list is created for them to complete before we accept it finally. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion to approve the resolution? So move. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve <clears throat> resolution number R10-2-21. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 10K, committee appointment. Um, we had a, one of our um, residents that sat on CDA for many, many years has sold his home and he is moving to Florida. So I had to make an appointment to the Community Development Authority, and I know a lot of you might know Brian Van de Creek. He's, his family has been in uh, Ashwaubenon for many, many years. He sits on the school board also. So Brian made an uh, application to be appointed to the Community Development Authority, so I would like a motion to approve that, please. I'll make a motion to approve the appointment of Brian Van de Creek to the CDA committee second we have a motion and a second to approve the appointment of Brian Vandecreek to the Community Development Authority all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye aye opposed motion carried number 11 items for next agenda if you have anything please give the village hall a call <clears throat> number 12 closed session items during the meeting the village board of the village of Ashwaubenon may convene into closed session pursuant to a Wisconsin statute section 19.85 parent one parent E to consider discuss act on deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing of public funds or conducting other specified public business regarding any public employee including village administration, IT and public safety employees where competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. <coughs> B, Wisconsin statute section 19.85, parent one, parent C, to consider, discuss, act on the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee, including village administration, IT, and public safety employees over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. C, Wisconsin statute section 19.85, parent one, parent F, to consider, discuss, act on village administration, IT, and public safety employees and related financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of spe specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems, or the investigation of charges against specific persons except where parent B applies, which, if discussed in public, would likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. 
D, Wisconsin Statute Section 19.85, Parent 1, Parent G, to consider, discuss, act on conferring with legal counsel concerning strategy with respect to Ashwaubenon public safety employment matters in which it is or likely to become involved. The village board may thereafter reconvene into open session pursuant to Wisconsin statute, section 19.85, parent two, to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. I need a motion to go into closed session. Move, move. to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second going to go into closed session. Voice vote, please, Beth. President Mary Kardoski. Yes. Trustee Gary Paul. Yes. Trustee Steve Kubaki. Yes. Trustee Ellison Williams. Yes. Trustee Tracy Fluke. Yes. Okay, we're in closed session. <clears throat> this conference is no longer being recorded. Are we relocating? Yep, yeah, we're going in A. Thanks, Aaron.